Hi, I'm Greg Mickling. New Jersey credit unions believe that all citizens need to understand the important financial matters that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Kessler Foundation, changing the lives of people with disabilities. PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey's credit unions, banking you can trust. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. United Water, making the planet sustainable is the best job on Earth. And by Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is One on One. We've had her here before. We have her back. But for the first time, listen to this introduction. Dr. Nancy Bladner, the president of Caldwell University. Yes, we're still getting used to that transition. Thank you so much. Tell folks the difference between going from a college to a university. That's a big deal. It's a big deal, and it was a long process, two years in the making. And, you know, I would say that Caldwell had actually already become a university. It just not, had not achieved the status or taken the title. But the process um, forces us to look at our faculty credentials. It forces us to look at our budget, our library holdings, and to really do an introspective study of who we are, the students we serve, and the number of master's degree and doctoral students particularly that we have. And so while we continue to be an institution that, that is focused on our students and on our excellence in teaching and in the classroom, we felt that we really wanted to become a university because to many of our students it signifies something a little bit different. And I had the experience, Steve, when I was with a group of students uh, over spring break in Spain. And uh, we were at the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona and mm -hmm. the tour guide said, are you um, high school? Our, our college, you know, the students, because they look young, okay. And we said, yes, we're a college. And so she began to give us a presentation. And suddenly I said, we're actually a university, because it was very clear that in that setting, college and university mean two completely different things. Do they? Yes. And she said, oh, then this is a different presentation. And so it really drove the point home that I'd been making back here in New Jersey. We have a fairly substantial international student population, and for them, to come to a university, I think, is much more prestigious. It has a very different connotation. And for them to return to their countries to be marketable when they go to work. For our own students who are graduating who might want to go on and do a professional degree or do a master's or a doctoral program in higher ed, to come from a university, I think, is going to help them as they go forward to apply to different educational institutions mm -hmm. if they want to pursue another degree. You know, the other part of this, Nancy, is that you and I have had lots of conversations with other college presidents, and you are out nationally talking to colleagues. And one of the things you told our producers that you wanted to talk about, which I found fascinating, which I want to talk about, is this whole question of a federal, new federal, <clears throat> excuse me, rating system. Mm -hmm. 7,000 colleges and universities are being evaluated, rated, if you will. And it sounds pretty innocuous to me, but you say it's not. Mm -hmm. And you say there are concerns that we need to understand before we just say, hey, sure, why not? Go ahead. I do. You know, this is President Obama's initiative. And I think that all of us in higher education can agree with the goals that he's trying to accomplish. And those are accessibility for students, affordability, and also completion of the college degree. So there's no argument with that at all. But let me tell you where a few of our concerns as college presidents come in. First of all, it's very difficult when you have 7,000 institutions that have diverse missions, diverse student bodies, diverse populations, to reduce everything that they do to a number or to a ranking or to a rating. So that's the first thing. It's pretty reductionistic. The second is that these ratings or rankings only take into account first-time, full-time, college students that stay at your institution and graduate. The number from the American Council on Education suggests that that's only 27% of the students that we serve. President Obama himself 
transferred. So he would not be in this system. As did I. Yes, as do many students. Many. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's sort of um, the trend today. That's very common. So that's one of the concerns. Another concern would be the metrics that are going to be used that are somewhat ill-defined. So when we talk about tuition, for example, are we talking about net tuition? Are we talking about sticker price? Are we talking about a four-year graduation rate or a six-year graduation rate? When we ask graduates to pay back based on their salaries, are we looking at program graduates or aggregate? Because if an institution, for example, has a medical school, a legal school, any professional school, those students, by virtue of the degrees they obtain, you would assume are going to be making a higher salary than someone who might be graduating from a liberal arts, faith-based institution. Like yours. Yes. So and they'll rate higher. We would rate lower. Right, they yes. would rate higher, but that's, yes. that's apples and oranges. And the problem is one that, I, for us, I haven't even gotten to, and this is, for me, the heart of the matter. Um, students that come to Caldwell are often, um, what I would say, being given a real opportunity or a chance to succeed. We have small class sizes, very caring faculty. I know many institutions do, but we hire to that mission. That's part of our mission. So we take a chance on students who come to us, and as a result of that, we may have more academically underprepared students than other institutions. We have certainly a large number of first generation going to college students, a very diverse student population, and students who come from a very so low socioeconomic bracket in many cases. These are students that are at risk for a That's variety right. of reasons. And so if President Obama's ranking goes into place, that's one thing. But in 2018, we're, we've been told that Congress will vote to tie Pell funding to the ranking system. Federal funding to? Yes. So and what are you going to do, like not accept those kids in so that your ranking will be higher? You've made my case exactly. So when we make a mission-based decision, all right, and so I take that student that I understand is living in his car and I move him into my residence hall. Or Which I you've done. I have on more than one occasion. And that's part of our mission as a Catholic Dominican institution, and we're proud of that. But would I at that point, or would someone who would succeed me in this role years from now, would that person then be forced to say, can I make that decision? Can I do what I believe is the right thing that's really in line with our mission? Or am I going to be hurting other students who come here because their federal Pell mm. dollars are going to be tied to a decision I make from the heart instead of the head, perhaps? <sighs> it's a tough wow. one. Wow, a lot to think about there. It is a lot to is think about. Is this in about. place? No, but it is scheduled to go into place for fall of 2015. And so right now there's a lot of uh, churning at the Department of Education as they're trying very quickly to pull these ranking systems in place and to get the data from a reliable source. And that's another part of the issue because, as you've said, apples are not always compared to apples. Sometimes apples are compared to non-fruit items. Wow. Um, on, Capital Report, on our sister program, New Jersey Capital Report, we're going to have Nancy in to talk more about the public policy implications of this because it will be an ongoing discussion. Give me one minute on the 75th anniversary of Caldwell University. Well, we're so excited. It's September 19th this fall, and we are celebrating the perseverance of Mother Joseph Dunn, who founded the institution as a Catholic college for women. Of course, we, we are no longer single gender, and certainly we have many faiths and many people on the campus that are very diverse. But it is a testimony to her perseverance that we're still uh, alive and vibrant today because she never gave up the dream to have Caldwell College. It's powerful stuff. Nancy Blotner is the president. Dr. Nancy Blotner is the president of Caldwell University. And the university status got, uh, kicked in when? December 9th of 2013, officially rolled out July 1st of 2014, Steve. It's a very big deal. Thank and you. And we're glad to have you as a higher education uh, colleague and partner and we wish you nothing but the best. My pleasure we'll to be here. We'll keep talking about this other issue uh, on the federal level as well. Thanks, Nancy. Stay right there. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we'll be right back in one-on-one -on -one right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Dr. David Duncan, attending neurologist, holy name, multiple sclerosis comprehensive care center. Good to see you, doctor. Good to see you. You're here to talk about MS. That's correct. First of all, what is it before we talk about um, how it's being dealt with? Okay. 
Well, it's a, an autoimmune disease that affects the nervous system. Um, when we talk about the immune system, it's usually um, meant to protect us. Um, so it uh, fights off infections, uh, scavenges for tumors and cancers. But in the case of, of autoimmune diseases, which MS is one, the immune system actually um, attacks the body. So in the case of, say, rheumatoid arthritis, it would affect the joints. Uh, in the case of psoriasis, the skin, and in the case of multiple sclerosis, it affects the brain, actually the lining on the nerves. How does it impact the body? Um, people, I mean, can present with a wide variety of different symptoms, so it can be anything as, as and probably the most common symptom is fatigue, uh, but people can have issues with uh, personality changes. Uh, they can have numbness, tingling, visual changes, balance problems. Uh, and that's what makes the diagnosis so difficult sometimes is that um, the, the symptoms can be so abstract. And Is it often misdiagnosed? Um, I would say it's missed sometimes for many years before it's actually done. Missed? What do people think it is? Um, I, I mean, I can, uh, a lot of times people, like I said, with fatigue, it, you know, the, a person comes into the doctor's hospital and they uh, are to the office and they're complaining of issues of fatigue or feeling kind of off. A lot of times, you know, it's maybe some depression or anxiety. So a lot of times it's kind of written off to more psychiatric issues initially. Um, and then people will present with a really demonstrative uh, illness of loss of vision or numbness from the waist down. And then it really becomes clear that something else is going on. So there's no cure here, right? No cure. No, but we're looking, the real focus is to, um, to slow, initially it was really to slow down the illness. I think we're getting more to the place where we're actually to put people in a form of a remission. Um, so uh, if we get you know, people early and we can take and use a, the right kind of medication for that patient because every person's illness is different, uh, we're, we're able to maybe have a, a strong impact. Let's talk about how, the, uh, how MS treatment and medication has really improved over the past, say 10, 15 years. Right. So, I mean, I probably started practicing, seeing my first MS patients, you know, regularly, maybe 20 years, almost 20 years ago. And we used to say diagnose and adios, meaning that you would diagnose a patient and then basically there wasn't really anything you could offer them. You would see them when they were having a problem and then, you know, that was it. Mm -hmm. um, about 15 years ago, there began medications, very early phase medications that could have a subtle effect. Um, and then more recently, in the last 10 years, we've had a, like a, a very rapid uh, cycle of new medications. So we probably have 10 different drugs, each working a slightly different way and, and each one more appropriate for one patient than the other. You know, we know several people who have MS, but at different stages. Why does it move at a different pace in each person or is that just the nature of what MS is in different people. I mean, because there are some people who have had a MS and they look to be functioning on a whole, on a pretty, pretty functional basis. Sure. There are others who are, who are like for 10 years, 15 years, and others with MS who have had it for five years who can't walk. I would say it's probably not one, just one disease. I mean, we're characterizing this illness based on a picture, basically an MRI scan, and we right. see multiple scars and we're labeling this, you know, MS. But in reality, there's probably multiple subtypes of disease um, within that, that whole category. It's either MS or not, like you're, you're making it sound well, we don't have a we don't have a biomarker or a genetic marker that we can actually label this so it's based on an MRI scan. So if you look at an MRI scan and you see scars, I mean, if you see somebody with a scar on their chest, that scar could be from, um, from a bad infection they had as a kid, right. or it could be from the fact that they were you know, cut or injured for some reason. So we're seeing these scars, and we don't necessarily know that the, uh, the pathophysiology. When you say a scar, you're talking about on the brain? On the brain. That's what this uh, illness causes. So the MRI looks at the brain, sees a scar on the brain. Right. And it's not so clear cut? Um, it's not clear cut. I mean, so if you just see an abnormal brain, that doesn't necessarily mean MS because MS is a progressive illness. So you want to see an MRI that continues to accrue new scars, and then you know you're dealing with something that's more of a progressive so illness. So describe your center, and is that why it's so multidisciplinary? Um, I would say that what I've learned over the years is that this is a chronic illness at this point, and it's important um, because it's a lifelong illness that you have to cover a lot of different um, 
issues in people's lives, and that comes from not just their treatment with their illness, but also you know, physical therapy. If there are you know, physical disabilities, there are you know, psychosocial issues. If people have issues with their jobs, um, there's other disciplines like urology and ophthalmology that are maybe affected. So it's good to have all those um, um, different disciplines kind of under one roof uh, to manage these patients. There's a mental health component to MS. What is it? For sure. Um, well, first of all, I mean, from the, the minute you make a diagnosis, there's that emotional effect of accepting a diagnosis. I mean, everybody comes with the baggage of what they were told this illness was or who they've seen in the media who's had the illness, and usually it's the worst case scenario. Um, and uh, so you have that to deal with. And then it's the life strugglers, the, the right life struggles with their husband dealing with it or their, their wife or spouse dealing with it and the, the physical uh, impacts that has on your work and your relationships. So it's a, it's a lifelong issue with that. Why do you call it an iceberg illness? Um, because um, a lot of times when patients are, are have, or have this disease, um, you'll look at a patient or people look at a patient and they go, well, you look fine because it's not really a, an illness that you carry on the outside as, as a, like a, a skin disease or so forth. So people can be affected with a lot of problems internally or, or physically, but to look at them, they look relatively normal. And we also talk about those emotional issues. Um, sometimes people will have personality changes related to the illness, um, cognitive problems, and those things you can't really see physically. So I kind of say that those are kind of beneath the surface and not really visible to the general public. Before I let you out of here, I'm curious about this. Are there any population or segment, segments of the population that are more susceptible to MS? Sure. So we, we, we have lots of different theories on why people m maybe do or don't get Does this disease. Does the research show one thing or another? Research suggests that there is a genetic component, though it's not a hereditary disease. Um, you'll see that um, in the general population, that's probably a tenth of a percent. There's probably 200,000 people in the U.S. who have the illness or more, maybe two and a half million worldwide. But, um, but when you look at patients who have MS, that if you're the son or the, um, the, the brother or sister of somebody with MS, you have a greater chance of having the illness. So there's a genetic, genetic component. But if you're an identical twin, meaning you have exactly the same genetic makeup, um, it's not 100%. So there's not a 100% genetic. There's maybe 30% greater chance if you're an identical twin. How common, so wait a minute, I wanna, how prevalent is it that someone will get on MS? I'm trying to understand the numbers here. So a tenth of a percent. States. Tenth of a percent is kind of the, 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 the general thought of a, a, a chance of the general population. So like uh, one of every point, point zero zero one per, you know, uh, of a of 100,000 people. Okay. Important stuff, Dr. David Duncan. I want to thank you from uh, Holy Name. I want to appreciate, I appreciate you coming in and talking about MS. People think they know what it is and they don't. We don't. That's why uh, we have you come and talk about it. I appreciate Thanks so much. it. Stay right there, doctor. One-on-one, -on -one, we'll be right back right after this. Thanks, doctor. Right, thank you. To see more one-on-one -on -one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are honored to be joined by our friend Jack Fanous, who is the executive director of the GI Go Fund. We met you at the... Uh, Russ and Angelica Berry yep. event, the uh, Berry Awards for Making a Difference. Put that in perspective. Uh, that was a, a real big uh, accomplishment, I guess you could say, for our organization uh, to be recognized uh, for the work we've done to win $25,000 uh, was a big deal for us, and it, me it meant a lot for our supporters to know that we're on the right track. Yeah, you won the Berry Award for making a, a very big difference. Uh, the GI Go Fund, as we put up the website, Jack, do us a favor, tell us what it is and why you started in 2006. So the GIGO Fund's a veterans organization that helps uh, veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, Vietnam veterans, uh, put their lives back together, whether it's find work, access health care, uh, or get off the streets if they're homeless. Uh, we founded the group after a buddy of mine was killed in Iraq, uh, Lieutenant Seth DeVorn. Uh, we founded it on the campus of Rutgers University. We raised our first $100 at a Rutgers football game selling stick flags. Uh, and uh, several years later, we, uh, we met Cory Booker when he was mayor of Newark, uh, gave us an office in City Hall. He treated City Hall as kind of an incubator for, for big ideas. And this was a pilot program to try to help veterans locally in the, in the area. There's you and Cory. Mm. Right there, that picture right there? Yep. And so what happens there? So how does it grow so quickly? Uh, it really comes from doing good work, I believe. You know, it's a matter of some veterans organizations are, are, are advocacy groups only. 
Uh, but we decided, since we're not veterans ourselves, the best way to make an impact was just try to help veterans reacclimate back home, whether it's fine work. We've partnered with Johnson & Johnson, psc and Panasonic here in New Jersey, who are really actively looking to try to help veterans find work, really recruiting them. Uh, psc and for instance, hired uh, the first veteran we ever got a job was uh, Sergeant Joe Pace uh, in 2008, and they've been addicted to hiring veterans ever they since. They hire them. Yeah, they just love them. They, they, so uh, people like psc and J&J, Panasonic, they have made a commitment, we're going to hire vets. Absolutely. And they're doing, a, they're doing a fantastic job. They're hiring tons of veterans. They know that veterans help the bottom line. They know that veterans are, are strong workers, good employees, uh, not only good followers, like everybody always says, but I heard from a veteran once say we're also good uh, followers, not just good leaders. Uh, so it's, it's a big deal to hire veterans, and they're setting an example. These are big companies that are setting an example for other companies to do the exact same thing. Hire veterans. You'll see what they do for your bottom line. What do you do for these vets? Do you, do you train them for job interviews, resumes? What do you do? So for, we do resume writing workshops with these big companies. J&J &J hosts them regularly, uh, where veterans that work at J&J &J, uh, will come down and tell these young veterans how they got the job. How do you present yourself? How do you translate your military skills? Uh, then sometimes there's job training that needs to happen. Uh, Kessler Foundation funded a program with us uh, that allowed uh, us to train veterans in customer service call jobs. Yep. Uh, that happened. That ended up being 30 veterans were working from home with psc and in customer call jobs, disabled veterans. They were actually the first ones during Hurricane Sandy to take the calls because they were on the phone at home. Uh, and it's just a matter of job training, job readiness, and really an, a, a strong advocacy with the employers and the companies themselves to really try to get veterans uh, at the front of the line to get these jobs. What kind of reaction do you get from most vets? Most vets are very, are very excited about the work we're doing. They see that we're uh, having a giant impact uh, in helping them find work. Uh, we're working on public policy that is, that is uh, impacting the veteran community. We were ahead of this VA issue, uh, the VA scandal that happened with the long wait lines. We were working with Cory Booker and Senator Menendez uh, on legislation to allow veterans to go outside the VA system. We've been working with employers and companies uh, to try to advocate on behalf of the veteran community that veterans are good for the bottom line, whether it's tax credits that come back, mm. uh, or it's, uh, you know, right now there's a new bill that's coming up from the, from the Senate right now, Hiring More Heroes Act, that would exempt employers from providing veterans with health coverage if they get VA health coverage. So it actually puts veterans at the front of the line now as we're talking about health coverage. You know, this is the uh, summer of 2014. We need to, I don't know, I'm not going to get into the whole VA issue. We'll do that on our sister program, New Jersey Capital Report, but I need to ask you about that. Yes, sir. We don't know how that situation is going to play out, but we know that veterans have not been treated nearly in the way they deserve to have been treated. Sure. What is it from a health perspective that these veterans need and want to go out and be productive citizens? First off, they need to be able to be seen by a physician, to be seen by a doctor. All right, that's step number one. So when you come home and you're waiting on long lines or traveling long distances to see a doctor, it takes up too much of your life. So you can't really start the rest of your life until you take care of that health care portion. When you come back, everybody says, go to the VA, go get your health coverage, right. go see your doctor. If you don't take care of that, if it takes six, seven months to take care of that part, well, then you're six, seven months behind the eight ball when it comes to finding a job, right. you know, putting your life back together, going to school. So we need to accelerate that process so that veterans, when they come home, can start their lives in totality more quickly. By the way, we'll put up your website. We'll keep, put up the website again, folks. If you're a veteran, if you know a veteran, if you're related, related to a veteran, any service that Jack's been talking about that you think could be helpful, go on the website. By the way, when people go on the website, excuse my voice, I'm, I'm losing it. If, if people go on that website, what is it that they find, Jack? So you find out some of the stories of the things we've done in the past, you find a place to donate, and you can, you can sign up as a veteran for job fairs, for resume help. Uh, you, can do, you can do pretty much everything Go back everything to the you need. donate part. Yes, sir. Money goes in, where does it go? It goes to fund our programs. Our programs, whether it be job fairs, uh, midnight missions for homeless veterans that live at Newark yeah, Penn Station. Yeah, talk about that. I've seen the midnight missions down at uh, Penn Newark Station. Newark Penn Station, exactly. Yeah, so yeah talk about that. That's our, pretty great. Our midnight missions, well, so we do stand downs, which are homeless veteran one day events. And we found that the majority of the veterans that are homeless aren't actually coming to us. So we said, let's go to them. Let's find them. We did the Cory Booker model don't sit behind a desk, go out to the public. What made and you find think them. they'd be at Penn Station? Well, we went looking for them. We found them at Penn Station. So we, we, we looked under the bridges at 280. That's where they live. Penn Station, they live at Newark Airport. 
Uh, so we do these midnight missions where nobody on the streets is a commuter, they're just homeless people. Uh, so we go hunting for homeless veterans. We've been, uh, we take the VA medical center with us, they take a mobile health unit out, we take food and clothes with us. Uh, we provide the food and clothes for everybody on the streets, not just the veterans, but we're really using that stuff to find the veterans. When we started working with the homeless population at Newark Penn Station, there were somewhere near 200 homeless veterans on the streets. We're under 25 now, and we've been doing this for three years. We're physically extracting these men and women off the streets uh, and getting them to VA housing. That's what it is, VA housing? Yeah, for the most part. There, there's, there's some public housing that's available, but VA housing is the first best option because they have medical care there that we can get the most. Before from. I let you out of here, Jack, I'm curious about something. I mean, this is part of a series we've been doing called Dom But Not Forgotten. Sure. Why do we forget? I think it's people are very quick to support the troops. Remember after the, when, the, when the war started, we had oh, yellow ribbons everywhere, magnets. Support the troops is easy. Uh, we know there are men and women deployed over there. They're in uniform. We send care packages. Support the veterans is a whole different, different avenue. When you come home, now they're in civilian clothes. They can be wearing jeans and a T-shirt. You can't really readily identify them as veterans. You don't realize that there are needs. Uh, and supporting the troops is great because it keeps the country together and patriotic, but supporting the veterans is where the work really needs to be done. When they come home, they're no longer supported by the government. They're no longer essentially government property. When they come home, they're civ civilians and citizens who put their lives on pause for us for 10, 15 years to serve this country, and it's our duty to help them press play. Uh, and sometimes people don't know that. But I will say that when people find out that there is a need out there with the veteran community, they are so quick to donate and contribute. Is that right? They're incredible. We, we do fundraising programs with, with major supermarkets. And if you compare what veterans organizations raise in comparison to any other cause, we blow them out of the water. Supermarkets been supportive? Yeah, Food Town is a big supporter here in New Jersey. Uh, they've been doing our, our fundraising drive, a dollar at the register. They do it from August to September, and we blow every other nonprofit out of the water because people want to support the troops. It's not because we have a great name or a brand. People just want to support the troops. 30 seconds. What has this done for you? It's really put my life in perspective, to be honest with you. It's, it's been the greatest honor and privilege of my life to serve these men and women, uh, these people who, after September the 11th, put their lives on pause and said, you know, I'm going to serve this country, I'm going to stand up. It's made me really realize yeah. how wonderful a country we live in. Great having you here. Keep Thank doing you. what you're doing. Thank you very we'll much. We'll be your partner. Appreciate it. Thank you, buddy. Thanks. Thank you. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One-on-One -on -One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Kessler Foundation, psc and &G, Johnson & Johnson, New Jersey's Credit Unions, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, United Water, and by Qualcare Inc. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger, powering NJ.com, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. This healthcare message is brought to you by MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. Choosing a new family doctor can be confusing. Check with your health insurer to see which physicians near you participate with your plan. Find out which hospitals the doctor uses and who covers when the doctor is away. And remember to schedule an appointment with your new doctor in advance to fill out any paperwork without the added stress of being sick.